Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. These are the list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis. The link for the handwritten notes is provided in the description box below and it is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article discussion. Our first discussion is based on this news article. This news article is about the capital punishment or death penalty. Now this news article is important because as we know the convicts of Nirbhaya case has been awarded death penalty. So this is one of the hot topic of the year. So in this backdrop we will discuss about the relevance of death penalty in the domestic and international scenario and we will also see about the arguments that are in favor and against of death penalty. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. First, the capital punishment is also known as death penalty. It is the execution of an offender who is sentenced to death after the conviction by a court of law for a criminal offence. Now see the capital punishment should be distinguished from the extrajudicial executions that are carried out without due process of law. And as you can see the term death penalty is sometimes used interchangeably with capital punishment. Though imposition of penalty is not always followed by execution because there is a possibility of commutation of the death penalty to life imprisonment which is a lesser form of punishment compared to death penalty. So by the term capital punishment what what we actually mean is the most severe form of punishment. It is the punishment which is to be awarded for the most heinous, grievous and detestable crimes against humanity. But the definition and extent of such heinous, grievous crimes vary from country to country, state to state, from age to age. So that is why the implication of capital punishment has always been the death sentence. And if you see the death penalty existed in India before independence also. As you can see that the Indian Penal Code which came into existence in the 1860s has death penalty as a punishment for several heinous and grievous crimes. And even the Code of Criminal Procedure and even several other ordinary laws has mentioned about death penalty. And after India's independence, India retained several laws that were introduced by the British colonial government including the Indian Penal Code. But after independence, two changes happened with respect to the Code of Criminal Procedure or CRPC. In 1955, the parliament repealed the section 365 clause 5 of CRPC. Because until then, this section mandated the courts to record reasons for when the courts decided not to impose death sentence for offences where the death penalty was an option. But this section was repealed in 1955 and again the CRPC was re-enacted in 1973 and several changes were made to CRPC and one such change was the important section which is section 354 clause 3. This section mandates the judges to provide special reasons for why they impose the death sentence. So we can see that the government of our country is in favor of capital punishment. So what about judiciary? Like any other matter the matter of death penalty also reached the judicial scrutiny. In 1973, the constitutionality of the death penalty was challenged in the Jagmohan Singh versus State of Uttar Pradesh case law. In this case law, the petitioners argued that the death penalty was against the constitution. But however, Supreme Court held that death penalty was a permissible punishment. Then again, in 1980, Supreme Court delivered a verdict in Bachchan Singh versus State of Punjab case law. This is one of the important case laws that you should remember when you discuss about death penalty. Because in this case law, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of death penalty again. But Supreme Court confined the application of death penalty to the rarest of the rare cases. This was done in order to reduce the arbitrariness of the penalty. So the current scenario is the death penalty is awarded in the rarest of the rare cases. So we can see that even the judiciary is in favor of death penalty. So as of now, as a whole, India is in favor of death penalty. And even one of the important reports of law commission on death penalty which is the 262nd report of law commission mentioned some crucial fact related to death penalty. It mentioned that as of 2014, India is one of the 58 countries in the world that has death penalty in its statute book as you can see in this picture. Here the countries are classified on their death penalty status based on four categories. The categories are abolitionist for all crimes, abolitionist for ordinary crimes, next one is abolitionist de facto that is the countries and territories which retain the death penalty for ordinary crimes but they have not executed and the final category is the retentionist that is the country has retained death penalty and also using it from time to time. 
as a punishment and in these four categories india comes under the retentionist category along with india there are some other countries also like china indonesia and united states they are also under the retentionist category so india still has death penalty in its statute book and india has even used it in the recent past in the year 2015 when yakub memon was executed in july 2015 now to know about the stages that are involved in death sentence cases in india you can see this picture and this table shows the list of capital offenses that are listed under indian penal code here you can see that not only treason murder and heinous offenses like rape attracts capital punishment but even the abetment of suicide also attracts capital punishment and in the beginning we saw that even some ordinary laws in india has punishment of death penalty in this table you can see such laws and even one of the laws which was recently enacted in the year 2009 has incorporated the punishment of death penalty now let us see some of the statistics on death penalty with respect to india see there is no clear data on how many persons have been executed since independence but the data gathered by the national crime records bureau on death sentences indicates that in the period between 2000 and 2012 around 1677 death sentences were imposed by indian courts so this means that on an average 129 persons are sent to death row every year and roughly one person is sent to death row every third day now this may seem like a large number but if you compare this with the cases involving murder convictions actions then this is a very small number only because the death sentence was imposed only in 1178 cases which is only 0.65 percentage of the cases that involves murder convictions so this was one of the point noted by the law commission's report along with this the news article mentions about one of the report prepared by national law university they prepared the data on the number of prisoners executed since independence till the year 1968 they prepared this under the project 39a this project 39a published death penalty india report in 2016 and in its report project 39a has highlighted the difficulty in obtaining the exact number of prisoners who are under the death sentence in our country the report noted that the prisons and other government departments do not have accurate records of the people whom they have executed and also this project's purpose to get accurate data on death penalty in india is hindered by an absolute lack of coordination between different official sources so as of now there are no reliable sources to quantify the data with respect to death penalty so these are some of the details that you should know with respect to capital punishment or death penalty in our country now the argument which arises with respect to capital punishment is that whether it is needed or not so now let us see some of the arguments in favor of death penalty and also against the death penalty first let us see the arguments in favor of death penalty the first argument is that death penalty provides deterrence deterrence is the act of discouraging an action or event through instilling doubt or fear of the consequences so here the argument is that death penalty will prevent future murders because if murders are sentenced to death and they are executed then potential potential murderers will think twice before killing another person due to the fear of losing their own life so the first argument in favor of death penalty is that it acts as a deterrent or a general deterrence now the second argument in favor of death penalty is retribution which is the punishment inflicted on someone as vengeance for a wrong act or a criminal act when someone takes a life the balance of justice is disturbed so those who are in favor of death penalty argue that only by taking of the murderer's life restores the balance and it allows the society to show that murder is an intolerable crime then after this next argument is that death penalty should be present in the statute books in order to contain terrorism so these are some of the arguments in favor of death penalty now what are the arguments that say death penalty is not needed see the right to life is the foundation of all human rights so the taking of life affects this foundation and even it is irreversible so it goes against the fundamental belief in the dignity and worth of every human being so death penalty is against right to life and as we saw death penalty is irrevocable so an innocent person can also be wrongly executed and it cannot be reversed this is a valid argument because 
even supreme court had once agreed that it has wrongly executed innocent persons the next argument is that there is no uniform and fair principle on execution of convicts on death row they say it is arbitrary even supreme court itself has said that death penalty is arbitrary it has noted that there is difficulty in distinguishing cases where death penalty has been imposed from those cases where the alternative of death penalty which is life imprisonment has been applied a next argument is that death penalty does not act as deterrence because a deterrence will be possible only when it is swift certain and proportionate to the offense committed but as you can even see in the nirbhaya case law the execution of death penalty of the convicts has been being postponed so those who are against death penalty they argue that this does not act as deterrence so far it has not served as a deterrent to control crime so these are some of the common arguments that are in favor of and also against the death penalty now when you discuss about death penalty we should also see about law commission's view on death penalty in the year 1967 the 35th report of law commission had argued that capital punishment shall be retained in india now law commission argued for retention of death penalty because it wanted to see death penalty as a refined form of retribution to publicly condemn the act of crime it noted that there is a category of individuals who are cruel and wicked and they are not capable of reformation so we can say that law commission at that time was in favor of capital punishment mainly because because of the unique condition of india and the society that prevailed at that time but after 48 years in the year 2015 when the 262nd report of law commission was submitted law commission had changed its mind this report was on death penalty which we also saw before in this report law commission noted that death penalty does not serve the purpose of deterrence hence it recommended for the abolition of death penalty for all crimes other than terrorism related offenses and also waging war against the state so we can see that as the society evolves the views change because in this 2015 law commission report it was mentioned that as of 31st december 2014 140 countries in the world had abolished the death penalty in law or in practice so let us wait and see if india will abolish death penalty in future or not so that is all about death penalty that you need to know from examination point of view in this discussion we saw what do we mean by death penalty or capital punishment we saw the statistics related to death penalty and we also saw the arguments that are in favor or against of death penalty with this we come to the end of this discussion the respect practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion these news articles mention that the authorities in maharashtra have decided to close some prominent tourist and religious attractions we know that maharashtra has registered the highest number of covid-19 positive cases in india so as a precautionary measure they have decided to close the prominent tourists and religious attractions so let us take this opportunity to discuss about these locations from examination point of view the locations that are mentioned in this news article are ajanta and ellora caves then siddhi vinayak temple of maharashtra then tulja bhavani temple and then bibika makbara so we'll discuss about these from examination point of view the syllabus that is relevant for this discussion is given here for your reference first let us see about the ajanta caves the ajanta caves are rock cut caves and these caves are located in the aurangabad district of maharashtra ajanta caves are a set of 29 caves in the form of gigantic horseshoe their construction began around 200 bc but later they were abandoned in 650 ad in the favor of ellora and remember that ajanta is one of the finest examples of the earliest buddhist architecture cave paintings and sculptures so ajanta caves are related to buddhist denomination now these caves comprise of chaitya halls or chaitya caves that are dedicated to lord buddha chaitya halls means halls of worship totally there are four chaitya halls in ajanta caves and they also have viharas which are the monasteries that are used by buddhist monks for meditation and also for the study of buddhist teachings now there was a question in 2013 prelims regarding these chaityas and viharas this is the question the question asks some buddhist rock cut caves are called chaityas while the others are called viharas what is the difference between the two now after listening to this discussion you may able to answer this question the correct answer is b which is chaitya is a place of worship while vihara is the dwelling place of monks now since the ajanta caves depict the buddhist denomination the paintings on their walls and ceilings of the caves 
depict incidents from the life of Buddha and various Buddhist divinities. And in these, the Jataka tales are also included in the paintings. These Jataka tales are about diverse stories that are relating to the previous incarnations of Buddha as Bodhisattva. So, these caves depict the Jataka tales in which Buddha is depicted as Bodhisattva. Then, there are also caves where the sculpture of Buddha depicts Buddha in a calm and serene posture also. So, these are some of the information that you should know with respect to Ajanta caves. Now, next is the Ellora caves. The cave temples and monasteries at Ellora are also located in Aurangabad and the rock carvings in these caves are inspired by Buddhism, Jainism and Hinduism. So, the Ellora caves depict three different denominations and there are totally 34 caves in Ellora which contain Buddhist Chaityas, Viharas and also Hindu and Jain temples. The caves are constructed over a period of 600 years between the 5th and 11th century AD. Some of the important discoveries in these caves are the cave 29 and cave 16. The cave 29 is also known as Dhumarlena because it is where the earliest excavations happened. Then cave 16 is important because it has the magnificent Kailasa temple. This temple is the largest monolithic structure in the world and it was known as Verul in ancient times. Now, one more important information that you should know from the examination point of view is that the paintings and sculptures of Ajanta and Elora were declared as World Heritage Sites by UNESCO in the year 1983. These paintings and sculptures are considered masterpieces of Buddhist religious art and they have had a great influence in the development of art in India. But remember that we saw that the sanctuaries in Ellora Caves are devoted to Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism. So, Ellora Caves not only depicts the Buddhist denomination but also Hinduism and Jainism. So, the Ellora Caves illustrates the spirit of tolerance that was characteristic of ancient India. So, that is all about the Ellora Caves. Now, the next location that is mentioned in the news article is the Siddhivinayak Temple. Let us know some crucial information about this temple. The full name is the Sri Siddhivinayak Ganapati Mandir. As you know, it is dedicated to Lord Sri Ganesh from the Hindu mythology. It was constructed in 1901 and it is located in Mumbai. The temple has a small mandap with shrine for Siddhivinayak and the temple has wooden doors and the wooden doors to the sanctum are carved with images of Ashtavinayak that is the eight manifestations of Ganesha. Now, next is the Tulja Bhavani Temple. This Tulja Bhavani Temple is located in the Balaghat Range in Osmanabad district of Maharashtra. It is a Shakti Pita dedicated to the Mother Goddess Tulja Bhavani. Now, the history of this temple has been mentioned in the Skanda Purana, which is a Hindu religious text. Now, the next location that is mentioned in the news article is the Bibika Makbara. It is also located in the Aurangabad district. It is the burial place of Dilris Banu Begum, who is the first wife of Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. She was also also known from another name, Rabia Uddurani. And this Bibika Magbara is a mausoleum, which means it is an above ground freestanding structure that have crypts or burial compartments to hold human remains. And you also know one of the famous mausoleum, which is Taj Mahal. And even this Bibika Magbara is an imitation of Taj Mahal. And this mausoleum is believed to be constructed by Prince Azam Shah, who is the son of Aurangzeb, in the memory of his mother between 1651 and 1661. AD. Now, since it is an imitation of Taj Mahal, so it has similar design to that of Taj Mahal and that is why it is also popularly known as the mini Taj of the Deccan. So, that is all about this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about some important tourist and religious attractions that are important also from ancient history point of view. We took it as a chance to discuss about these locations. Since these locations are in use, we may expect a question based on these locations. With this, we come to the end of this discussion. The respect practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next discussion. This news article mentions about the passage of Appropriation Bill 2020-21 to in Lok Sabha. So, in this context, we will discuss in brief about the stages that are involved in passing budget. We will also see about Appropriation Bill and then the news article. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. We know that the Union Budget for 2020-21 to was presented in the Parliament on 1st February of 2020. We discussed about the budget in detail on our 2nd February 2020 analysis. Have a look at it to know more about union budget. Now, with respect to today's discussion, what you should know is that the budget goes through six stages in Parliament. They are first presentation of budget, then general discussion, then scrutiny by departmental committees, then voting on demand 
demands for grants then the fifth stage is the passing of appropriation bill and the final stage is the passing of finance bill we have discussed all these on our second february analysis so today we'll just limit our discussion to appropriation bill only so the article 114 of indian constitution deals with appropriation bill in this the article 114 clause 3 mentions that no money shall be withdrawn from the consolidated fund of india except under appropriation made by law so accordingly an appropriation bill is introduced to provide for the appropriation of money out of the consolidated fund of india now here you should note that as per article 114 clause 1 an appropriation bill shall be introduced in lok sabha it means it cannot be introduced in the Rajya Sabha. So on a whole, we can say that this bill is nothing but a document showing the expected expenditure of the government for the financial year. This money is required to meet the grants that are voted by the Lok Sabha and also for the expenditure charged on the Consolidated Fund of India. Now know that the procedure for passing an appropriation bill is just like the money bill. It requires a simple majority that is more than 50 percentage of the members present and voting. After that it will be taken to the Rajya Sabha and before this the speaker endorses that the bill is a money bill because as we know under the constitution the speaker of Lok Sabha enjoys a special position in so far as certain matters pertaining to the relations between the two houses of parliament and one such special position is that the speaker of Lok Sabha certifies the money bill. So from this you can say that Raj Sabha has very limited powers when it comes to money bills because it cannot reject or amend the bill but it can only make recommendations and Raj Sabha must return the money bill to Lok Sabha within 14 days either with recommendations or without recommendations. Now with respect to recommendations Lok Sabha can either accept it or even reject it. Even based on these facts, there was one previous year question which was asked in the year 2013. This question asked what will follow if a money bill is substantially amended by the Rajya Sabha? And the correct answer is option A only because the Lok Sabha may still proceed with the bill accepting or not accepting the recommendations of the Rajya Sabha which we just saw. So this is what happens with respect to a money bill. But now with respect to appropriations bill, you should know that according to article 114 clause 2, no amendment shall be proposed to any appropriation bills in either houses of the parliament that is neither in Lok Sabha nor in Rajya Sabha. Once the appropriation bill is passed by the parliament it then goes to the president and after the president gives his assent the bill becomes an act. This act gives authority to the government to withdraw the money from the Consolidated Fund of India for various purposes. But the bill becoming an act takes time. It takes at least till the end of April. But the government needs money to carry on its normal activities after 31st March, which is the end of the financial year. So to overcome this difficulty, the Article 116 of the Constitution provides for vote on account. This authorizes Lok Sabha to make any grant in advance in respect to the estimated expenditure. This happens when voting of the demands for grants and appropriation bill is pending. Now such grant in advance is passed or granted after the general discussion on budget is over. This advance is generally granted for two months for an amount equivalent to one sixth of the total estimation. So this is the background that you should know with respect to appropriation bill. Now today's news is that the appropriation bill of 2020 to 21 empowers the government to draw over 110 lakh crores from the Consolidated Fund of India for its working and also for the implementation of government's programs and schemes. Now in this news article another important thing is mentioned which is that the Lok Sabha speaker has used guillotine. In this guillotine refers to the exercise in which the speaker of the house on the very last day of the period that is allotted for discussions on demand for grants puts to vote all the outstanding demands for grants at a time specified in advance. The aim of this exercise is to conclude discussions on financial proposals within the time that is specified. See we know that the parliament has very limited amount of time for scrutinizing the expenditure demands of all the ministries. So after the pre-decided period of discussions over the spending is completed a guillotine is applied. Once the speaker applies the guillotine all the outstanding demands for grants whether it is discussed or not they are put to vote at once and after this the appropriation bill is taken into consideration. Now the invoking of guillotine is important because it ensures the timely passage of the finance bill and also the timely conclusion of debates and discussions on the budget of that financial 
bill here. So as we saw in the beginning, after the passage of appropriation bill, the only pending stage is passing of finance bill. And finance bill pertains to the government's taxation proposal. So after it is passed, we'll discuss about it. So that is all about this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about appropriation bill and the constitutional provisions related to the appropriation bill. And we also saw about guillotine that is applied by Speaker of Lok Sabha. With this, we come to the end of this discussion. The respect practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next discussion, which is based on this editorial. This editorial talks about the preparedness in terms of health facilities that are needed from India's side since the number of uh, new coronavirus positive cases has been on rise. So, in this context, today we shall be seeing the current healthcare facilities that are available in India, which has been discussed by the author. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. As we know, on 11th March, WHO declared the novel coronavirus disease outbreak as a pandemic. And in our country, the total number of cases that are reported positive for new coronavirus disease have crossed more than 100. So, understanding the seriousness of the issue, the Government of India invoked powers under the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897 to enhance preparedness and containment of the virus. And even the Government declared the new coronavirus disease as a notified disaster under the Disaster Management Act of 2005. We have discussed about these in many of our discussions. But now, the question is whether the national and state health systems will be able to provide the necessary healthcare resources to the population or not. Because in times of pandemic, the demand for material resources will only continue to rise. And especially in this scenario, the demand for testing kits, for hospital beds, for ventilators, even masks and hand sanitizers are expected to increase further. And if you see, at a time when the disease did not even have a name or when the number of deaths was were increasing, China had built an emergency hospital to treat the coronavirus patients from Wuhan and it is said that this emergency hospital was built in just 10 days. But still China's health systems struggled to cope up the demand and similarly even Italy had faced many deaths due to this disease and it is also facing huge strain on its health systems. So that is why now this question arises whether India's health system is robust enough to meet this emergency. We know that health infrastructure is an important indicator for understanding the healthcare policy and welfare mechanism in a country. Infrastructure has been described as the basic support for the delivery of public health activities. Effective public health actions rely upon a well-trained public health workforce and also it relies upon good and sufficient health infrastructure. But in reality, the Indian healthcare delivery system has been far from satisfactory, according to the author. Not only the inadequate health infrastructure, but also the public expenditure on health by the government is also not satisfactory. The author is saying this because India's health expenditure as a percentage of GDP has been abysmal or extremely bad. It is just at about 1 percentage and this is far below other emerging BRICS economies and even lower than the neighboring countries of Nepal and Sri Lanka, according to the author. Even the National Health Profile of 2019 has noted that since the year 2009 to 10 until now, there has been no significant change in healthcare expenditure by the government. The National Health Profile also indicates that the highest percentage that is allocated for healthcare in our country is just 1.28 percentage of GDP in the year 2017 to 18, and the per capita public expenditure on health is also very minimal, which is of 1,657 rupees in 2017 to 18. In in addition to this, if you see the WHO Bulletin of 2018, the out-of-pocket expenditure remains common in India. In 2014, it was estimated that the out-of-pocket expenditure is around 62 percentage of total health expenditure of our country. So what is this out-of-pocket expenditure? See, while our country is trying to invest around 2.5 percentage of its GDP into healthcare by the year 2025, the global average on healthcare is about 6 percentage, which is comparatively high with respect to India. And as we saw that our government spending on healthcare is just around 1 percentage still today, and the per capita public expenditure on health is very minimal of Rs. 1657 per year. So this indicates that a person could get 4.5 rupees per day for his healthcare from the government. 
but the average expenditure for a person is estimated somewhere around Rs. 4,657 per year. So the remaining money is borne by the person as out-of-pocket expenditure and this money comes around Rs. 3,000 rupees. and this is nearly 62% of the total cost that is incurred for that person's health. So from this it is very clear that our government is not spending much on health. So what should be done now? See the epidemics are known to change the course of history. Even before the new coronavirus disease the Ebola disease that happened in 2014 to 16 in West Africa, then the swine flu epidemic that happened in 2009 to 10, etc. They all had significant impacts on human society. These epidemics are well known for killing of large percentage of global population and it had altered the course of human history. So the ongoing coronavirus is also a potential pandemic which is in the course of altering the society with nearly 5000 deaths and it has spread to around 122 countries worldwide. And with respect to India, it has affected nearly 100 people and it has spread across 13 states or union territories. So the author here suggests that India must treat this pandemic as an opportunity to increase the budgetary allocation for health and it should also see this as an opportunity for the expansion of health infrastructure in our country. Author is suggesting this because there is evidence that increase in public expenditure on health has resulted in betterment of communities in terms of their health as well as their financial position. So India must use this opportunity to harness the finite resources optimally for the benefit of all. So that is all about this discussion. With this we come to the end of this editorial discussion. Now let us take one question. This question is based on Hucky Picky tribes. We have taken this question based on this news article which mentions that there is fear among the Hucky Picky tribes of Karnataka about the new coronavirus as some people from their community have returned after a trip to South Africa. The people from this tribe travel overseas frequently to Sri Lanka, Africa and even to United Kingdom to sell their medicines and spices. So based on this only we have taken this question. Now the first statement is they live mainly in the state of Karnataka. See the Hakki Piki is one of the major tribal communities in Karnataka. In Kannada the word Hakki stands for bird and picky stands for the verb to catch. Therefore, the community is known as the bird catcher, which is their traditional occupation. And the Hakki Pikis are said to be the descendants of Gujarat state. They left Gujarat some 400 years ago because of the war that took place between Rana Pratap Singh and Akbar. From Gujarat, they migrated to South Indian states such as Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And today, they are mainly concentrated in Karnataka in the districts of Shivamoga, Davanagere and Mysore. So that means this statement is correct. Now here the question asks for the correct statement so you can eliminate option C. Now the second statement is they sell medicines and spices from forest. Now we saw that their main occupation is trapping and selling of live birds. The Hakki Pikis are semi-nomadic tribes who lived in jungles for several centuries depending on this bird catching as their main occupation. So they try to live close to the forest land so that it is convenient for their occupation. Now since they stayed in jungles and near jungles over several decades, they have also become experts in indigenous medical system. So in the recent years, they make a living out of selling medicines, spices and even offering pain relief services like body massage and so on. So that means the statement is also correct. Now also know that the Hakki Pikis are also settled in the camps and hamlets which are provided to them by the government. And they speak the Indo-Aryan language even though they live in the southern part of India where the Dravidian languages are spoken. And even the scholars name their mother tongue as Vagri. So they speak Vagri at home and they speak Kannada for their daily business. Now the third statement here states they have been recently declared as particularly vulnerable tribal group. Now this statement is wrong because they are declared as scheduled tribes from the state of Karnataka but they are not yet declared as PVTGs. And also remember that only two tribes from the state of Karnataka have been declared as PVTGs. They are Jenu Kuruba and Koraga. Here the question asks for the correct statement. So the correct answer to this question is option B 1 and 2. Now let us take another question. This question is based on Pakke Tiger Reserve. Now we have taken this question based on this news article. It mentions that there is a temporary suspension of the survey work for a road project that passes through the Pakke Tiger Reserve. The suspension of the survey has been enabled because many of the activists are against this project. The question asks, in which of the following biodiversity hotspots in India, Pakke Tiger Reserve is located? Now to answer this question, first you should know what is a biodiversity hotspot? It refers to a biogeographic region that is characterized by two things. First, by exceptional levels of plant endemism 
and second by serious levels of habitat loss and totally there are 34 biodiversity hotspot which cover 2.3 percentage of earth's land surface and these biodiversity hotspots are the areas which are suffering biodiversity loss and they require attention now with respect to india there are four biodiversity hotspot as you can see in this picture they are himalaya biodiversity hotspot indo burma biodiversity hotspot sundarlands including andaman and nicobar islands biodiversity hotspot and then the western ghats and the pakke tiger reserve lies in the foot hills of eastern himalaya in the eastern kaming district of arunachal pradesh so the pakke tiger reserve falls within the eastern himalaya biodiversity hotspot so the correct answer to this question is option a now this tiger reserve is considered as one of the best protected national parks in the country and this tiger reserve is home to over 2000 species of plants 300 species of birds 40 species of mammals 30 species of amphibians and even more than 30 species of reptiles and many species of flora and fauna are globally threatened so this tiger reserve is one of the important regions for the conservation of these threatened species and particularly this tiger reserve is known for its sightings of four resident hornbill species also so these are some of the crucial information that you should know with respect to pakke tiger reserve now let us discuss the questions that were displayed during the news article analysis session this question is with respect to ajanta and ellora caves first statement is ajanta and ellora are the only cave architectures from india which are listed as unesco world heritage site now we know that ajanta and ellora caves are unesco world heritage site and they were declared as world heritage sites in 1983 but they are not the only cave architect included in this list even the elephanta caves are also part of this list we know that elephanta caves are are near Mumbai and the rock cut of these caves are mainly dedicated to Lord Shiva and they are in the world heritage sites list since 1987. So this statement is incorrect. Now the second statement is both Ajanta and Ellora caves are devoted to Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism and represents the spirit of tolerance in ancient India. Now this statement is incorrect because remember that Ajanta caves are devoted to the Buddhist denomination but the ellora caves are devoted to all these denominations and they represent the spirit of tolerance in ancient india so this statement is also incorrect hence the correct answer to this question is option c both one and two because the question asks for the incorrect statements only now this question is based on union budget first statement is article 114 mandates the union government to pass an appropriation act in the parliament to withdraw money from the consolidated fund of india now this statement is correct because article 114 deals with appropriation bill and the clause 3 of this article mentions that no money shall be withdrawn from the consolidated fund of india except under appropriation made by law so accordingly an appropriation bill is introduced to provide for the appropriation of money out of the consolidated fund of india and it is introduced in the lok sabha only so that is why this statement is correct now the second statement is appropriation bill should be passed by both houses of the parliament before passing vote on account see the purpose of vote on account is to give grant in advance to the government to meet its expenditure for a new financial year till the appropriation bill gets assent so vote on demands are passed after the general discussion on budget is over and then only the appropriation bill will be passed so that means this statement is incorrect and here the question asks for the correct statement so the correct answer to this question is option a one only now let us take one main question based on gs paper 2 the notion of an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth has no place in our constitutionally mediated criminal justice system do you agree that death penalty is necessary in india give arguments in favor of your answer now for answering this question you can mention about the current scenario in india with respect to death penalty that is in how many cases death penalty is given as a punishment by the courts of india then you can either agree with death penalty then you can also write an answer against it you can write the answer and post it in the comment section your answer will be reviewed and appropriate suggestion will be provided within a reasonable time frame with this we have come to the end of today's sessions if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation